Thank you so much for coming. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, before we begin, uh, we are in Lenape Hoki, um, the ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. When when we talk about doing the land acknowledgement and acknowledging the land you know, that we're standing on, I think we have to think about um, the difference between an empty gesture um, and something that is a step towards something a little bit more meaningful um, than that. And I think that is action. You know, That really is based on us as individuals and as institutions and what we're doing together going forward to support the futures of the Lenape peoples. Because when we acknowledge land, we're really acknowledging people who are here and alive and present and who have a continued relationship with this space. So I'd just like to say that to, to begin and to thank you again for coming um, and also to thank our amazing panelists for being here and also to thank Kitty Height, who has done a lot of work to sort of um, dream up uh, doing an event here um, and to thank the Historical Society. Um, for all the work that you do. Um, and I'm going to say just a few very brief words about the particular program that we're hosting tonight. Uh, because it, it really came from two different sources. The first, of course, is the Free Library's One Book, One Philadelphia program. Uh, and we're very grateful to them for spearheading that and for involving us in it and for all of the work that, that they did to bring our institutions together and to bring Philadelphia together. Uh, the second source is a series of internal institutional conversations we've been having about our collections uh, related to Native Americans, how they came to be, whose perspective they represent. So although I know that you folks are going to benefit tremendously from hearing our panelists speak tonight, I think HSP is probably going to benefit most of all because our hope is that this is just a beginning to thinking about our institutional history vis-a-vis -vis Native Americans. Again, I'm obligated to open with this. Hey, Kurumosi Mahashu Mohomo, Duruensi, Alushi, Alquis, Sakima, O Lanapeok. I'm Curtis Zuniga. My Lenape name is Alushi Alquis. It translates into, he is like a fox. And I represent the Delaware tribe of Indians. Our traditional name for the Delaware are the Lenape. And I carry with me uh, certain credentials of authority and experience in being selected as a speaker. But I also greet you on behalf of Chief Chet Brooks and the Delaware tribe of Indians in Oklahoma, where I come from. So, with that. Let's see, they gave me a little clicker too. Delaware tribe of Indians, and let me quickly say that the name Delaware is our colonial name. Lenape is our name, and that, it's in your title too. Lenape is our name. Delaware, that name was given to us by the colonists, the English, the British. The colonial governor in the Virginia Territory was Sir Thomas West, the Thor third Lord de la War, de la War, de la War, Delaware. That's who the Native people, the Native inhabitants in the River Valley became referred to by the Europeans and ultimately the Delaware is who we were called. We are Lenape. Um, I want to run through some of the history, but I will say that I'm going to make reference to the first treaty signed with the United States of America in 1778. We are an Algonquin speaking peoples, Eastern Woodlands. That's our language stock, is Algonquin, much like the Shawnee, Wyandotte, Ottawa, <coughs> Miami, others. Same basic language stock. 
currently, I guess you better. Can you all hear me back there? Yeah. Can you all hear me ah. back there? Yeah. Um, currently, we have a membership of approximating 10,000 man, man, woman, and child all across the United States. But we are headquartered in northeastern Oklahoma. And we have a modern elected tribal government and our principal activities are delivering social services and trying to do economic and business development. <coughs> All right, here's a map of what we call Lenape Hokey, the land of the Lenape. And you can see if I get this. There we go. All right, so we're here and therefore Principally, the Delaware Indians that are in Oklahoma today are the ones, the Southern Unami dialect of the Lenape language, the people downriver. So here in Philadelphia, these, my ancestors, the Lenape ancestors, came from this area here. We brought with us this Unami dialect in our language and we bring a history that's predominantly here, which is interactions with the British, the Dutch, William Penn, up here in the New York area, that's more of the Muncies. Then you get up north of that, you start getting into Iroquois country. But we have a number of place names, towns, villages, and the like, that were very much the foundation of the lands in which you all reside in today. This collectively is the Delaware homeland. Now it wasn't, we didn't build a border wall, <laughs> but that is generally known as the land of the Lenape. A little bit of idea of what life was like. our ancient wisdom, religious practices, and our stories of origin are as ancient as the mountains and the waters. Our creation legend says, a great turtle rose from the depths of the waters and met with sunlight and in time. A little bit of earth that was on the back of that turtle meeting with the sun. From that grew a great tree, the tree of life, of which the humankind came. Now, it might sound fantastic, but it is a something that the Lenape people claim as far as traditional origins. Pre-contact life, we lived in bark huts called wigwams, we hunted, we fished, we had the bounty of the waters and the bounty of the forest. <laughs> Hunting and trapping, fishing, you see the nets, even hunting with a bolo type of hunting implement in addition to bow and arrow, spears, agriculture, you know, we weren't nomadic, roaming Indians hunting the buffalo. I still get a lot of that from people. Do you all live in teepees? And did you hunt the buffalo? Oh, that's completely different in Indian people. However, years, decades later, when we were moved out into the Central Plains, we became buffalo hunters because that's where the food was, in addition to being scouts for many westward expeditions. But as you look at this depiction of agriculture, it's the women doing that, because they had great power. In our societies, women were not subservient to men. We had different roles that we played in our society, but it was to achieve balance not just in the physicality of the roles we played, but it was also having to do with 
spiritual responsibility. <laughs> Women were the, the ones that, that grew, that drew, drew from the earth and grew the foods. They had the knowledge of planting, using implements made out of all kinds of things, animal bones and wood. Women, I'm gonna say this right now, it was true then and it's still true today. And I'm not running for office either, so. <laughs> Women are the backbone of our societies. They are the collective conscious of our societies. And I've been the chief of my tribe before, but I didn't make any major decisions and do things until I consulted with some of the grandmothers. <coughs> They're the ones that kept me humble and straight. So they had roles that were very important. I'm kind of glossing over a little bit. I'll just say this. During the early part of the 17th century, the Lenape pretty much dominated all of the trade and commerce with each other and with other native peoples in Lenape Hokey. Then came, in 1681, now we already had European contact with the Dutch, the Swedes, even the Finns. And we had villages that were set up, although we didn't integrate. You had a Lenape village here, and then you might have had a Dutch village over here. And all of that was negotiated territory. And the, Del and the, the Lenape didn't just like sit around and go, oh yeah, well, we've got a bunch of land here. We're not doing anything with it. Yeah, come on in, you know, help yourself. Uh, let's trade some beads, you know, and you can have all of this land. It was not like that. I'm telling you, there's some things in these history books that were written by people that didn't know the real story. And for all of us, that's the kind of stuff we got in our history books when we were going to school. I, me too. I'm gonna bring up a term. This is going way too fast. I'm going to bring up a term called the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery, where European powers were given a holy mission to come to this land and to take control of it in the name of king and country and in the name of Christ. And the directive was you either subjugate and convert the natives or you kill them. But you do it in a way so you can take their resources and send those resources back as a tribute to the imperial kings of Europe. So William Penn shows up and he's got this charter. I've got this charter given by my king, King Charles II. This is our land now. But I want to negotiate peaceful arrangement so we can have trade and commerce because I want all the stuff from your land. So some of the history and all of this uh, presentation where the Indians are kind of, even in these paintings are a bit subservient leaning before, oh, Governor Penn, you know, oh, we're so glad you're here. You're saving us from this, you know, savage lifestyle. <laughs> no. Some of this is fancy and fiction. What the Lenape liked about Penn and the Quakers was this idea of, uh, there were common themes about life, self-determination, freedom, liberty. And that's why they initially got along with Penn because it became reciprocal. It's like, yeah, I, I like this way of life of Quaker, Quakerism because it's so similar to our life in general. And so the Treaty of Chacomoxon allowed for Penn to establish his colony that became where we are today. Another painting there. And while treaties might have been consecrated with 
writing on parchment paper, put your X or put your mark on here, with the Lenape, we used wampum belts, wampum beads made from shell, clamshells, beads that were sewn together to make a belt that, that was consecrating the agreement between the Lenape and William Penn. And I understand there are facsimiles of that and even a couple of the originals that are still floating around here. Frontier villages and the way of life, multi-ethnic. We had a leadership of a group of people, not just one. And that was the problem the Europeans had. They said, take us to your king. We want to talk to your him. We want to talk to your king. And we're like, we don't have a king. I want to talk to the person that speaks for your people. Well, we don't have just one person. We have a council of people. But the Europeans didn't understand that, and they wanted to trim it down to, we want to make one person the king we're going to recognize so that we can engage and sign these treaties so that we can engage in trade and commerce. But ostensibly, that was the reason, but the story behind it was because once you got that leader to sign the treaty, the piece of paper, the agreement, then it's like, if there was a disagreement, then people would be, that's not what we agreed to in our talks. Sorry, I got your chief signature here. You're bound to it. No, 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 we don't want to do that. This isn't what we thought we were going to achieve with our discussions, but it was backed up by military power. Now, uh, I'm rushing through this here. Uh, you can see some of the towns with these names, and then further towns throughout Pennsylvania. Here's kind of an interesting footnote, right? Here, Hoxatani. You know about that, right? <laughs> and it's shaking their head. These people here, they. They'll deny the science of climate change, but they'll accept weather for the next six weeks based on a rodent. <laughs> but in the Lenape language, the translation of Puxatani is mosquito town. <laughs> for real. All right, well, just real quickly, and I'm gonna go back to this slide right here. Our removal ultimately brought us out of Lenape Hoking. I've already run out of time. Let me just quickly dispense with the slides here. I want to get to a couple of important points. The Lenape, they were coveted in a, in a neutral, to take neutrality in the War of Independence. George Washington made great efforts to talk to the Lenape, to their war chiefs, and, and to ask for the, at least their neutrality, that they would not fight for the British. If they wouldn't fight for the Americans, that they would just stay out of the way, because they had great power still, military power, knowledge of the lands, knowledge of the waters. Ultimately, the Lenape did agree to help the American Revolution. And that alliance ultimately became when the new United States was using its power through the United States Constitution, the power given to the United States Congress to regulate commerce. The Commerce Clause in the first article of the Constitution says, Congress has the power to regulate commerce with three entities, the several states, the foreign nations, and the Indian tribes. That gave us a legal and political status unlike any other so-called racial group. And it exists to this day. That's why we have casinos. <laughs> when this country was two years old, on September 17, 1778, 
Lenape leaders and United States military leaders at the treat at Fort Pitt signed a treaty. It was the first Indian treaty in the history of the United States of America, the second treaty the, United, the new United States had ever entered, entered to. First one was with France, thanks to old Ben Franklin. But the second treaty the United States ever signed was with the Delaware. September 17, 1778, and you know what? In that treaty, in the exchange of agreements that allowed for the growth of the United States in Lenape Hoking, there was a promise of the establishment of equal representation in the Congress. Yes, there was the intent to establish a 14th state and an all Indian state, and if you read the details in that treaty, the Delawares would be placed at the head of that Indian state. Wow. But, like all things, all agreements, all treaties, the only thing that they actually fulfilled was they agreed to take our land, and they did that. And we were expelled, and we broke up into different groups. This slide will kind of show you the diaspora of different groups that went in different directions. My people, the Delaware Tribe of Indians, the main band that were recognized in some of those treaties and the like, followed this path, continually pushed westward, down this way, crossing the Mississippi River during the time of Andrew Jackson's removal, up into Kansas, from 1830 to 1866, and ultimately down into the Indian Territory, where today we are established. The Delaware tribe is in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, in northeastern Oklahoma, and the Delaware, by the way, are any of the relatives from Delaware Nation, Office of Historic Preservation, right here, they are headquartered in Anadarko, Oklahoma, but we both, Delaware Nation, the Band of Delaware Nation and the Band of Delaware Tribe, we have historic preservation offices set up here in the state of Pennsylvania. Delaware Nation is set up at Allentown. Delaware Tribe has an office of historic preservation at East Stroudsburg University. We still come back, we still are engaged in everything from archaeology to the Native American Graves and Protection, Graves Protection and Repatriation Act because our ancestors are here, our roots are here, our spirit is here. And every time, even though our people are so far removed from those days, every time I come back here, my spirit connects with the spirit of the ancestors. It's an enduring spirit. And it's also the spirit of the waters, the forests, the mountains, the ancient ones, that spirit still exists. And I liken myself and our people in Oklahoma as being taken away, ripped from the arms of our mother and forced to go far away. And yet, when we come back, when I come back, and I offer tobacco and prayers and greet my spiritual ancestors. I feel like that orphan child that's been reunited in the arms of my mother. That's what I get out of coming back here. That is the enduring spirit of the Lenape people and it is firmly based on our spiritual connection with the land and that is the heart and essence of who we are as a people. I apologize to this organization for going over my allotted time but I at least needed to get some of that spoken. I'm going to want to thank the Historical Society for hosting this event and also uh, my new friend Stern for inviting me, Kitty Haight, for coordinating that contact to my esteemed colleagues uh, and friends who are speaking this day. Uh, I greet you on behalf of the Natakoke Land of the Nape Tribal Nation, which is located in southern New Jersey. Our chief is Mark Gould and we are the northernmost of three interrelated 
tribes that have remained in the area around the Delaware Bay. I'm picking up essentially where uh, Curtis Zunica left off because the history uh, between those that left the region and those that stayed behind diverged at the end of his presentation. As he had already mentioned, the Lenape were referred to as the grandfathers of the ancient ones in ancient times by the tribes around them and still are to this very day. Um, and the region from uh, New York, uh, Western Connecticut, and all of New Jersey, uh, Eastern Delaware, uh, Northeastern Delaware, and Eastern Pennsylvania is all part of Lenape Hill Game. Intersecting with that territory is the territory of the Nanticoke people. Uh, which were referred to in ancient times as the Tidewater people, still are today. And my people are from the region where those two peoples converged, the border area. And in colonial times, we referred to as the Bay Indians. The Lenape of uh, what was called West Jersey, because at the time, New Jersey was actually divided into two colonies very early on. There was West Jersey and there was East Jersey. Those of you who are from New Jersey may even notice that some things are still referred to in that way in certain areas. Prior to our dealings with William Penn, we actually had dealings with other Quakers in southern New Jersey uh, and central New Jersey. And in the region in the area of Salem and Cumberland County, we dealt with uh, um, uh, John Fenwick and actually had a treaty with the with the Quakers in that area and uh, had arrangements to live in harmony with them. Prior to that, the Swedes were among us in that area around the Delaware Bay. One of the places where we met, many of you may be familiar with the, uh, the, the treaty at Shackamaxon and the, um, the treaty tree that was there, descendants of which are still at Haverford University and we have a descendant of the tree that is still at the Penn Treaty Park. Well, uh, 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 the signing of treaties, or the, the cutting of treaties, actually took place in southern New Jersey prior to that. And this was the Great Salem Oak, which was, for a time, the oldest tree in the state of New Jersey. Unfortunately, it fell about a year ago, and uh, it it's, it's, it's actually has little descendants. Haverford is in the process of, of caring for some of the descendants of the Salem Oak. But that treaty was cut with the Quakers there, and we continue a relationship with the Quakers of that area. Uh, the Burlington Friends Meeting also is a point of contact between the Quaker community in West Jersey and the Lenape community. And one of the chiefs, Akinikin, is actually interred uh, in, the, in the graveyard behind the Burlington County, excuse me, the Burlington Friends Meeting Hall. Our people survived an invasion, and the Nanako portion of our tribe, because we have a compound name, we are actually both Nanako people joined in with the remaining Lenape families that stayed behind as many were forced further and further west. Uh, the Nanako from among our family actually uh, dealt with John Smith, uh, the same John Smith of the Pocahontas stories dealing with the Powhatan community. Uh, we initially tried to kill him, uh, and then wound up trading with him. But about 90% of the Lenape and Nanako population was decimated within the first century of contact. That means one out of every 10 survived. And the decimation was because of disease primarily, but also of actual armed conflict. The new immigrants presumed, presumed authority over our people and over our lands. Uh, my friend Curtis already spoke about the doctrine of discovery that actually dictated how we were going to, to survive upon the lands that were actually ours, given to us by our creator, because of the principle of that doctrine of discovery. As most Lenape people were pushed further and further west, actually migrations out of uh, New Jersey had happened primarily by about 1740, although the, there was a reservation of, in New Jersey that continued until the early 1800s. Not all the not they were on that reservation called the Brotherton Reservation, but it did continue until then. But this essentially traces that migration that was men mentioned earlier. We had already been pressured onto reservations. A lot of people don't know that the first reservations weren't out west, they were right here in the east. 
and many of them were established in the late 1600s uh, up and down the East Coast. And the Nanakote people in Delaware and in Maryland and the Lenape people in central New Jersey were pushed onto reservations and also in small tribal areas called Indian towns. And the community that I come from actually was from one of those Indian towns that had a loose connection with the one reservation in New Jersey. And our ancestors also were on three or four reservations in primarily Maryland and one that actually crosses over into the state of Delaware. All of which were disbanded, even though they were supposed to be where we could continue to live in peace and harmony. Uh, those promises wound up being broken along with the other 400 and some odd treaties that were broken within the history of this country, uh, the promises that were made to Native people. One of the things that happened for those of us that stayed behind, uh, that had already partially integrated into society, was that we were being reclassified. That if, if you were baptized a Christian, you were no longer considered an Indian in the eyes of the law. Uh, they would change your race. They would have you also perhaps as a free person of color. Uh, that I'm sure Dr. Bloom will be getting into in her presentation. Different terms were used after baptism. And it was a free person of color or a mulatto instead of the term Indian. One of the things that happened in the state of Delaware, which is, which is actually where uh, my own family line comes from, is that in 1740, there was a law that defined what an Indian was. And this is something that comes out of the doctrine of discovery and continues to this day with various laws and programs at the federal level. And an Indian was defined as a non-Christian living in the woods and eating primarily deer meat. So if you had been baptized a Christian, you were living in a European style home and ate chicken, you were no longer considered an Indian even if you were born as an Indian. In addition to that, a later definition was modified in Delaware indicating that an Indian was somebody who was living far away from the state of Delaware. So it was a systematic erasure of the families that had stayed and continued to live in community, continued to identify with one another because there was a need to erase any lingering promises or land claims. And so if you're able to just simply say that people are no longer here, you don't have to think about the promises that were broken. By the way, I earlier introduced my, myself and indicated that uh, my chief, Mark Gould, uh, uh, I was greeting you on behalf of Mark Gould. That is uh, a drawing of Chief Gould when he was much younger. If you see him, uh, you can tell him he still looks that good. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we see in New Jersey is that there are uh, three tribes that have been recognized legally by the state, um, two of which uh, have, have roots that are absolutely there in the state. A third are people who came up from Virginia from the uh, communities, the, the indigenous communities in Virginia, and intermarried with uh, some of the remaining uh, remnant Lenape that were in that area. There are three. I'm going to, however, be focusing in on my own community and the connected tribes uh, with whom we share family, the Natakoke Lenape. And we're the original people of the Delaware Bay region. Uh, these are photographs of our people. And we're clustered still in the area around the Delaware Bay. And the northernmost being my own tribe, the Natticoke Glen and the Napi Tribal Nation. A tribe just outside of uh, Delaware, Del Dover, Delaware, in an little area called Cheswall. Uh, that is the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware. And then the Natticoke Indian tribe in Millsboro. Each of these communities have roots that go all the way back to contact and are documented going all the way back to contact. So much so that by the 1800s, the latter 1800s, our family names were on record uh, and being studied by the Bureau of Ethnography, which at the time was a branch of more or less an agency that had affiliation with the federal government. And for many generations, the tribal government, which is, this is a very common story for tribes that remain up and down the, uh, the eastern seaboard, the tribal government moved into the churches. <coughs> And by the early 1800s, we had established our own congregations, and the leadership of the churches was the leadership of the tribe. So much so that by the end of the 1800s, there's a, a newspaper article actually published here in Philadelphia 
about one of our uh, churches that was in Cheswall, and one of our elders of the church made it very clear that while everybody was welcome to come and worship, you had to be one of the Indian people in order to join. You had to be, be one of the uh, uh, fa family members in order to join and vote. And the reason was because being able to vote in the church determined what was going to happen for the tribe. And that continued uh, straight up until the 40s or the 50s. And these three communities, these three churches, are historically designated as American Indian churches by the United Methodist uh, Board of Global Missions. We've continued to maintain community and governance throughout the generations, primarily initially in the churches after a national breakup and so many of our people being pushed away. But then uh, for those of us in New Jersey, in the late 60s, there was a push to reorganize and to actually uh, have a reorganized uh, tribal government with an elected chief and council so that the government would not just simply be in the church, but would be out of the church. Some of this was caused by demographic shifts where people were starting to intermarry, whereas prior to that, you had to marry within the three communities in order to continue to identify and stay within the communities. The photograph, uh, the oldest photograph, up to uh, your left, my right, in the upper corner, that was the individuals that were Nanakoke that were organizing much earlier in the 1900s um, and were actually standing on the steps of the Delaware State House and they are advocating for themselves even back then. Our folks had our own schools, maintained our own congregations, protected our own communities. There are stories within the, the Nanako Blending Lenape community where the men would actually patrol the area at night because of the, the raids the, uh, of, of racists that were coming in and trying to disrupt, disrupt the community and gun-wielding men would be ready at an instant to defend the community. Uh, the other photograph, you see uh, Chief Gould um, with his headdress, uh, three of our chiefs in the uh, lower left-hand corner, and in the center of the photograph, that's a photograph, uh, the center photograph is from uh, the very early 70s, and those are the individuals that reorganized our uh, tribal government out of the churches. And there were many of our elders that were worried about that because they were afraid that if we became uh, self-advocating outwardly that the federal government was going to come in and take the little bit that we had because we'd been operating for so many generations kind of undercover. But uh, with the push for cultural identity and pride that was raging through the country in the 60s, the same was happening in many American Indian communities actually across the country. We are still here, we're still alive, we're still well, we're still maintaining our dances. My tribe has an annual powwow um, in June. The Nanakoke have an annual powwow in September. Uh, it is open to the public and you can find information online about it. Our elders are honored. They have an uh, elders council and communal meals every week. Our children are involved with national organizations, Indian organizations, especially Unity. Uh, these are some of the representatives, the young people from our tribe that went to Unity within the last couple of years. That is a national organization of, of youth from across the country representing many different tribes. We maintain a relationship with the nation of Sweden. That is the king of Sweden shaking hands with Chief Gould. And that is a relationship that actually has been renewed several times one time on our tribal grounds in southern New Jersey, where the affirmation of friendship was signed yet again. Uh, my tribe, and matter of fact, my children participated in the opening of the Swedish embassy with the new embassy about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, in Washington, D.C., and we were honored guests. We provide for the social services, for health services for our people, uh, through tribally controlled community services, We've established organizations, some of which are charities, some of which are for-profit business businesses operating under our, our sovereign government, and we continue to work toward a better future for our people. One of the things that has been an issue that I'm constantly asked, I'm asked usually two things. What do you call yourself? 
Do you call yourself Native American? Do you call yourself American Indian? What do you call yourself? And I really don't have an issue either way. There are some that have prefer one over the other. But one of the things that you'll notice, and you may have heard it when, when Curtis Unico was presenting, the common term that we tend to, to hear among ourselves is Indian. And what I have learned is that at least at the national level, many national organizations continue to use American Indian because that's the term that was used in our treaties. That is the term that is used in the Constitution. And the minute you begin to change language, you begin to erase history. And so that's one of the reasons that many still cling to that term, term even though, you know, technically it was erroneous because Columbus didn't know where he was. So the other thing that, that I'm constantly asked about is exactly what is a tribe. And while there are uh, various definitions for various legal purposes, essentially, uh, a tribe is, an, is a, whether it's a band, a tribe, or a nation, is, has some interrelation of the families within the tribe that go back to the point of contact uh, and beyond, that they've been living in community throughout the time period since contact, and that they have some form of tribal governance where they have acknowledged each other as being part of that same group. So it's historic, it is continuous, it is interrelated, it is self-governing. That's what a tribe is. And it's, ind it's indigenous. Now there's a uniqueness to indigenousness and there's some differences because a lot of people wonder, well, you know, why are you always pushing for these rights and that, that, those rights? Why aren't you just American? And there's a big difference because some of the rights that non-indigenous uh, groups have in this country we don't have without some sort of political status as, a, as American Indians belonging to a tribe that has some level of recognition. And that, that in, includes the fact that our arts and crafts are, can't be called American Indian unless we are members of a tribe that's been recognized by the federal government or the government of a state, that we have to prove our Indian identity in some sense. I mean, one of the big examples you have right now is running for president, Elizabeth Warren, all the controversy around her simple claim that she had uh, you know, Indian ancestry created all that controversy. Uh, the no other culture other than those who were brought here by force in chains from the African continent have had an absolute policy within federal history of the destruction of their culture. And our culture only exists here. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So if we become a part of the melting pot, our culture absolutely disappears because there is no other nation somewhere else where it is being celebrated or perpetuated. For more information, here is some of the contact information. I apologize for going over by two minutes and 15 seconds. <laughs> I thank you for your attention. Before we get started, I want to make a, a very important correction to your program. I am not, in fact, Namdekook Lani Lenape, um, or native in any way. I am a descendant of a Swedish settler whose son became um, a negotiator and, and what's called by anthropologists a cultural broker between the native tribes of the Delaware Valley and um, the Swedes and later the English. <clears throat> I am honored to have been accepted in many ways by uh, the Nanticoke and Lenape people in Delaware and New Jersey and uh, to be trusted with the presentation of some of their history. Um, I don't think I'm going to be quite as dynamic as uh, Reverend Norwood and uh, Chief Zuniga. Uh, but I hope that I will, uh, that my presentation will help to expand um, an understanding of the stories that they have had to tell. For the most part, um, I've been researching the Cheswold community in Delaware, the Lenape community, because the Nanticokes had um, a 
gotten the interest of anthropologists in the late 19th century, and a lot of research focus was placed on that community. Um, whereas the Cheswell community really tried to avoid the limelight for a long time. But my research uh, is directed towards learning from documents that were never intended to tell stories about Native people um, and tweezing out details that we might otherwise not know. So my research has two basic principles, that the records kept by your Americans were not designed to identify Indians, and race is a social construct and not an objective fact. And as evidence of this, I give you the Robert Dean family. The Robert Dean family was classified in the U.S. Census in 1860 as mulatto. This is a, a sort of catch-all term that uh, was used particularly in the 19th century for people who were actually black without understanding what their identity was. In 1870, these same people are identified as white. Now, as far as I know, we haven't developed, or they had not then, developed a process for changing skin color, hair quality, color, etc. So they didn't change. What did change? What changed was that in 1870, census enumerators were given specific instructions not to use the term mulatto for people who didn't show obvious signs of African ancestry. We don't really know what those signs were, but those were the instructions. And it seems clear that to the enumerators in that part of uh, Kent County, the Dean family did not look black. And the only other choice was white. They were landowners, so they were relatively wealthy. But the Deans today would be considered Indian. And for this and other reasons, I and other resource, researchers argue that the genetic makeup of individuals is less important than the survival of communities as cohesive units. And this is what um, Pastor Norwood talked about as, as the survival of communities. Um, going back in history, it's, it is, the fact that these communities stayed together as people separate from European and African um, communities is, is what's important. Um, sometimes Delaware's <coughs> Indians have been referred to as forgotten, as in um, C.A. Westlogger's 1943 book, Delaware's Forgotten Folk or invisible, which is a term that my colleague, the late Edward F. Hyde, um, applied because Native people simply weren't visible or obviously visible in the documents and in um, the way that the Euro-Americans referred to them. Now, there are two ways two really official ways in which Delaware's Indians were um, classified or sort of declassified um, in, the, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. First of all, the word Indian is simply not used in documents after the first half of the 18th century. You don't find it in, t in most well, in Delaware records at all, until the late 19th century. 
And in fact, in 1770, the Delaware legislature declared <coughs> that um, we don't have any relationships with Indians, and we don't expect to, because they're somewhere else, and I can see a typo, oh my gosh. Um, from their situation, can a, the situation of those Indians cannot expect to have any relations with them hereafter. And yet, there were two, and we can document that there were two native communities that existed not uh, in, within the state, and one of them was not more than a few miles from the capital city. But there were actions that Delaware's native people took um, to become inv invisible. Um, these were protective actions. They adopt the, adopted the outward trappings of European culture, including Christianity. But they lived in European-style houses. They farmed in European ways. Um, they wore European clothes. And they made deliberate choices to hide in plain sight. Pastor Norwood has talked about um, that the, the elders in the Nanaka Mani Lenape community in New Jersey really argued against any kind of public identity. Um, and this was in part to protect their community and for those that had been able to acquire some land. They certainly wanted to keep hold of it and not have it taken away. So they changed their way of life from a rather free, um, seasonal round, uh, from the woods to, to the shore, to the woods again to hunt um, and fish, and the, the, the waters, um, the waters of the Delaware Bay were certainly prolific. Um, at that time. Many of the people of their relatives moved away in, and the Canadian Delawares um, tell a story that the people who left, left to preserve the language and the culture, including their spiritual practices. Those who stayed, stayed to protect the connection with the land, and it's that connection with the land that Curtis, Chief Zinnega, has related to you, this sense of being where, um, where they were supposed to be. In fact, in the place that the Creator had given to them to take care of. There were also, um, some events that happened that made it easy for your Americans to say, oh, yeah, we don't need to deal with those pesky Indians anymore. Um, there's several occasions where um, Indians are identified as um, the last. So in Pennsylvania, we have Hannah Freeman, Indian Hannah, who was considered the last Native person, the last Lenape in uh, Chester County. She died in the 1790s in a poorhouse. And uh, Dawn Marsh has written what I consider a very good book. Um, but what, really, what we know about Indian Hannah is a letter that was uh, written for her to the um, managers of the, of the Chester County Poorhouse where she died. And we have really not that much information. But in the mid-1990s, Ned Hyde and I excavated a site that we call the Bloomsbury site in a part of Delaware that we refer to as Mitsawaket because this is the name 
that was given to this piece of land and the land around it um, in the, the so-called deeds that transfer responsibility of, of this area to um, European Americans. This wood site was occupied in the 18, in the early 19th century up until 1816. And it was occupied by at least three people who were, had connections to the uh, Cheswell Lenape community. Agnes Lopen Sappington. Um, Sappington was her possibly second husband, and she later married uh, a Durham. These are names that are associated with the Lenape community um, in Cheswell. Benjamin Sisko was on the land from 1790 to 1800, and Thomas Concealer, um, and that is the community's pronunciation, from 1800 to 1813. Not only <clears throat> did these um, tenants on this property have names that we now associate with uh, the Lenape community, but they were making artifacts, making tools that showed their connection to the people who had been displaced by the incursion of Europeans. And this piece is more difficult to date. It's a, the base of a case bottle, uh, a square bottle designed to be shipped in boxes. And both of these are clearly shaped using techniques that the ancestors of the people of Cheswell used when they had only stone to work with. And they had transferred those skills to glass. Now this is something that we find throughout the world uh, where Europeans have taken over areas occupied in some cases by tens of thousands of years by the same people. For instance in Australia, they stopped using the, making and using these kinds of objects in the first generation after contact. But the people of Bloomsbury were living 200 or more years after for first contact, which means that although they were living in European-style houses and wearing European-style clothes and farming in European ways, they had maintained the contact with their primeval ancestors in a way that can't be denied. And there have been many efforts to deny that um, Native people that we know are here, that they could possibly be done with us. And these communities were, or these people weren't entirely forgotten. Um, Sharp is a man who, who compiled histories of a number of areas in this, a number of places in this area. Um, and his history of Delaware recounts a story about a group of people who were distinct and, and purposely distinct from their European and African um, neighbors. And they had, and when we look at some of the other information that <clears throat> Scharf presents, we can see that uh, they're the same names that are still present in the community. Importantly, Scharf reports that um, they have lived apart from both white and colored neighbors, and have generally intermarried among themselves. So part of, part of what I needed to do when I started researching these, this community was to figure out if um, people with those surnames, historically associated surnames, still lived in the same area 
where, um, where they live today. So I just took the censuses and counted the number of households with those surnames uh, in each, what we got in Delaware call hundreds. These are um, basically geographical areas that were used for administrative purposes um, up until recently. And so these are the three hundreds that um, where the surnames are abundant and more abundant than in other um, other hundreds. And that's exactly where the Lenape still live today. So the 1782 census I've used because the 1790 federal census has disappeared. We don't have it anymore. What's interesting is that all of these people are identified basically as white. That is to say, there's no racial designation. And in fact, this was the census of white households. In 1800, we have about 50 households with the historic surnames in, um, in King County. But something very peculiar happens in 1810. They all disappear. We go from about 50 households down to 15 households. But the simple explanation for this is that they all moved away. But we don't have any record of that. If we look at the um, at other records, at, at tax assessments, there's no change in the number of, of people that are listed. So something else changed. And the only possible explanation is that they decided to, um, for some reason, not count those Indian people. And they could do that because the um, law establishing the, the amendment to the Constitution that establishes this, this census says that Indians don't have to be counted. Now it does say it's supposed to be Indians not taxed. But there are a lot of reasons why, even if they didn't want to be counted, that the enumerators would have counted them anyway, because that's how they got paid. And they could be fined a huge amount of money if they didn't provide a correct count. And not only that, the house, head of household could be fined if he, if he didn't cooperate. So my, I think we have to conclude that there was a reason why they were counted, and it was because they were Indians. And not only the, the enumerator thought they were Indians, because he didn't have a lot of power. Um, but the people surrounding them, the land-owning white men that surrounded that community said, oh yeah, we know who they are, they're Indians. We don't talk about it, they're Indians. And <coughs> the federal official in charge of the Delaware Census had to agree to it too. He was the Marshal for the Delaware District. Now, in 1820, we see the number um, of households being counted comes up. But now, we have a bunch of people described as mulatto. And we still have discrepancies in the way that people are classified. There's 100 where they're always classified as black, no matter what. Um, but there's, there's some flexibility in the system. The number of households that are counted goes up in 1830 and 1840. And I think that has a logical explanation too. Because beginning around 1820, you get this movement to move all of the Indians 
west of the Mississippi, and it's no longer safe to be Indian. If you want to stay on that land, that land that the Creator gave you responsibility to, for, then you have to accept whatever designation that the powers that be gave to you. By the mid-19th century, um, some of the people in these Indian communities were moving to various places, and in some of those places they are identified as Indian. So there are quite a few people from Delaware and New Jersey that moved to Michigan, where they actually recognize that Indians exist, and they start showing up as Indian on various kinds of documents, including the census, but in particular on vital records. There's even a John Norwood <laughs> who's identified as, um, as Native, in part because his father is identified as Native, as Indian, on, um, on his death certificate. By the end of the 19th century, there's some recognition that there are, in fact, two communities in Delaware, um, and I'm just going to run through some of this fairly fast. This, docu this document reprints an article that ran in an obscure Delaware newspaper that talked about um, the so-called Wars of Delaware. It was picked up by the New York Times. Uh, anthropologists got hold of it, and the Nanako community became um, an object of study by anthropologists. The state of Delaware um, also began to recognize in some kinds of official documents, particularly um, uh, school records, as Indians. So, there were Indian or more schools that were separate, and um, they had separate school districts, part of the colored school system, but separate from um, black schools. And I was going to talk a little bit about how you recognize um, a community, but I think that you can get an idea that we can go through this as um, that these surnames that they took on have survived to the present time. Uh, people have gotten interested. This is different than the experience that the uh, New Jersey people have. And, but again, we have a community that survived, often in hidden ways. Thank you. Mm -hmm.